everyone, and thanks to, to Forum for having us. Uh, I, I, you know, before I talk a little bit more specifically about the United States, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the world situation. We do live in a, in a globalized world, uh, and uh, you know, when you have a globalized economy, you have globalized crisis, and you also have globalized class struggle. And I think if you look around the world today, it's clear that what we're seeing is, is a real transformation in the, in the way things are as compared to the way they were 10 years ago. Um, so I think that if we want to understand uh, where we're going, we have to keep in mind that when uh, you know when it comes to history, when it comes to analyzing uh, you know political events, we have to remember that things always change, things are transformed, and that the next 10 years of uh, U.S. politics, U.S. economy, and the consciousness of the American people, uh, uh, you know, affected by these events that are taking place, will not be the same as the last 10 years. So a lot of people look back at the last 10 years. And it's true, there was low strike levels, uh, there was all kinds of economic uh, problems, which we'll get into some of the details. Uh, but I believe that it's uh, if you have a Marxist understanding of how society works, of how the working class moves, that sooner or later, uh, all of that uh, is going to have an effect on people's consciousness, and they're going to inevitably going to enter into struggle. And as, as Brad mentioned at the beginning, uh, there's only one way out of this economic crisis for the capitalist class, and that's austerity, it's cuts, uh, and it's an all-out offensive. And I think in the last uh, period, we've seen this. And it's not just because they're, they're, they're mean, or because they're evil, or, or, or because they just have a right-wing ideology. The fact is, this system is, is in serious crisis, and if they want to continue the system, the only way out is by further squeezing and exploiting the working class. So, so the, the real question then when we look at the economy is who's going to pay? Who's going to pay for this crisis? Uh, of course, they want us to pay. They want the working class to pay. They want us to work longer. They want us to work harder. They want us to, to have fewer people working, uh, more people piled into houses. Uh, they want higher student debt. They want higher health care bills. They want us to pay for the crisis. And at the same time, of course, we're seeing a tremendous polarization in wealth, and we're also seeing tremendous enrichment on Wall Street. And when you look at the, you know, it's an election year, so a lot of people are, are wondering, you know, what, what, uh, what the way forward is politically in this country. Uh, but a lot of people don't want to admit the fact that in reality, objectively speaking, things are actually worse today for the working class majority in this country than, than they were under George Bush. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have followed what's been going on in Greece in particular. Uh, I mean, you know what's been going on uh, across the whole of Europe, really. Uh, but it, it's really a, a worldwide phenomenon that we're seeing uh, that you just simply didn't see a few years ago. Last time I was uh, in this neighborhood speaking, about five years ago probably, uh, I was talking about Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela and Latin America generally was at the forefront of this, of this process, this revolutionary process, the beginnings of this worldwide revolutionary uh, conflagration that we were beginning to see. Uh, and, and it was very exciting because we hadn't seen anything like that in a while. But if you look around the world today, I mean, it's not, uh, it's not just Venezuela, it's not just this or that country, it's the whole of Europe now, it's uh, even Britain, England, you know, uh, there's been big strikes uh, throughout the UK, in Canada, you know, we never hear very much about it. I live in Minnesota, right next to Canada, and we still don't hear anything about what's happening there. But there's been big, important political movements, especially in the last few weeks, especially among the students in, in Quebec. There's been a, a real uh, earthquake in the political scene, uh, in the shakeup of, of the main political parties there, with, uh, with the very impressive advances of the Canadian Labour Party, the NDP, uh, and yet we don't hear anything about that. We don't hear about the wildcat strikes, uh, big strikes in you know, the airlines, uh, the postal service, uh, really exciting stuff happening just uh, to the north of us, and they don't want us to hear about it. Obviously, we've uh, seen the events in North Africa and the Middle East, the Arab Spring, you know, a little over a year ago. Uh, what was happening in Egypt, I think, woke everybody up to the fact that you know, they were lying to us. We were told, oh, the people in the Middle East, they're all terrorists, they're all backwards, they're all, you know, so religious that, you know, they, they, don't, they, they don't understand democracy, all this kind of stuff. And we've seen the tremendous heroic mobilization of people across the Middle East, overthrowing one dictator after another, and, and you know, that process is continuing. 
Uh, we also see in Israel, again, the biggest demonstrations in the history of Israel took place last summer uh, for housing, for jobs, for better economic conditions. Um, we've seen in Russia as well, where for a long period there was a, there was not much in the way of class struggle. A lot of people thought that uh, Vladimir Putin basically had an iron bridge on the country and nothing would ever change there. Uh, this last spring, big demonstrations in Russia. In India and Pakistan, a uh, very important part of the world, very populous part of the world, uh, all kinds of, of uh, you know, brewing trouble with trade unions uh, in that part of the world. Sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria, I mean, it's just like one country after another. I mean, there's general strikes in Nigeria, uh, and of course, Latin America continues to be extremely interesting. Tomorrow, there's elections in Mexico. Uh, a couple of days ago, there was a demonstration of 1.4 million people in Mexico City uh, in the run-up to, the, to these elections. Uh, and there's also elections in Venezuela later on this year. So everywhere you look, uh, there is not a single stable regime. And here in the United States, they try and make us think that somehow the crisis has passed, uh, everything's going to go back to normal now, uh, you know. And I, I would agree, things are going to go back to normal, but it's not going to be the old normal. It's going to be a new normal. Uh, it's going to be lower wages, it's going to be uh, more work hours, it's going to be higher unemployment, it's going to be home foreclosures. I mean, uh, all these problems that, that seemed unthinkable just a few years ago are now what we're supposed to accept as the norm in this country. Now, the economy in the United States. Now, as a Marxist, uh, I, I don't think that the economy automatically determines what happens in society. But in the final analysis, uh, the economy is the base upon which the, the rest of the superstructure of society rests. And if you have a sick and decaying economy, inevitably you have expressions of sickness and of decay uh, in society uh, as well. And I think if you look around a lot of neighborhoods right here in St. Louis, you see examples of that and how things are just, you know, they're supposed to be getting better, right? They're supposed to be progress. We're now richer than ever as a country. We're now more productive than ever as a class. Uh, and yet we're actually making significantly less than we were just 30 years ago. And, and conditions are, are getting steadily worse. Um, if you look at uh, the, the, the wealth disparity, like I said, over the last 30 years, uh, well, yeah, last 30 years or so, worker productivity in this country has doubled. We're about 100% more productive. And yet we're making 77 or so percent of the wages that we were making back in the 70s. So we're making less, uh, even though we produce a, about twice as much as before. Uh, and at the same time, the, the Fortune 500 companies, if you look at the Fortune 500, uh, you know, there's millions of com companies in this country, millions of companies. And we're told that, you know, small is beautiful and all these little companies are, 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 are the way forward for, for, for America and for jobs and all this stuff. But the fact is the top 500 companies, just a small percentage of the total companies in this country, they control, they produce nearly 75% of the GDP of this country. In those 500 companies, there's a tremendous amount of wealth concentrated. Uh, and uh, they're getting richer, richer and richer and richer. Uh, between 2009 and 2010, their profits grew by 81%. 81%. I'm sure all of us would like to get an 81% raise uh, or an 81% bonus uh, over the last period. And at the same time, you know, you read the newspaper every single day. I mean, it's, it's almost incredible how arrogant they are about how rich they're getting, how well they're doing, and yet the rest of us are supposed to just kind of be conformed with. With, uh, with this situation. Now, a lot of people think that, well, you know, if Obama is reelected, uh, then the real Obama is going to come out. He was just, he was, his hands were tied and he couldn't really do anything. The real Obama is going to come out and he's going to, he's going to bail out Main Street. He's going to do all this and he's going to do all that. But the fact is, even if he wanted to do something like the New Deal, and to be honest, I'm, I'm a little surprised that he hasn't done a, just a little bit more, at least cosmetically, to make us think that there was some hope and some change. Uh, but even if you wanted to, uh, the system is, is in such a state that it's not possible. The original New Deal was, uh, was possible because at that time, the United States had tremendous reserves of gold. It was the biggest creditor nation in the world. Now the United States is, is in so much debt that if we were any other country, if we were a company, certainly, we would have we would have been forced to you know forced to the wall by now. But this is the United States. This isn't just any old country. 
and a collapse of the U.S. economy obviously is going to have would have tremendous effects throughout the world. I mean, if Greece could set up a chain reaction throughout Europe that would have inevitable effects here in the United States, just imagine what you know an even deeper crisis in the United States would mean. So Obama simply isn't capable of doing this. You know, you hear the Republicans and the Democrats arguing about. You know, uh, we need to create jobs, we need to do this, we need to do that, and your program for jobs doesn't work, and mine does. But the, the, the proof of the pudding, as they say, is in the eating. Where are the jobs? They haven't been able to create any jobs. If it was so easy to create jobs, they would have done it by now. Um, and they're not able to do it. So with the election coming up, people, people are starting to ask themselves. I mean, they were very excited about uh, Obama last year. I mean, it was, you know, I think here in St. Louis, some of the famous pictures where it were taken, along with the ones in Chicago. I got kitchens. Huge, you know, huge crowds of people. When I saw these pictures, it seemed to me almost like this was Venezuela. You know, people crying on the streets and, and just, you know, it seemed like at last, after eight years of, of Bush and Cheney, that, that something was going to change. And I think it's understandable that a lot of people, you know, really had these hopes in this guy. But we have to understand that if you follow the money, and I'm sure you all have, we know who really calls the shots in Washington. We know who really calls the shots for these two political targets. Congress. And we know who really controls these politicians, exactly. So over the last 30 years, uh, the American dream has become more of a nightmare. You know, there, there was a real economic basis for the American dream. You know, at least he had relatively stable employment. He had relatively good chance of getting a house. He had a relatively good chance of, of, of having a career. Uh, young people today especially have absolutely no future uh, under this system. I mean, they're, they're called a, a lost generation for a reason uh, because there's, there's just no way out. I mean, unemployment among young people is at about, um, let's see, uh, it's over 50%. It's like 51.2% unemployment last July. And July is usually the peak because you get all the kids getting summer jobs and stuff. It was less than 50% of young people were employed. That's the lowest since 1948, the lowest since they started uh, keeping these records. And if you look at student debt, a lot of young people think, well, okay, maybe, you know, I just need more education. I get a, you know, if I get a degree, I'll be able to, you know, I'll become a teacher. I'll do something useful uh, in, in the world. Um, so they go to school, they accumulate all this debt, and uh, you know, student debt now has reached one trillion dollars. There's more student debt than credit card debt. There's more student debt than, uh, you know, than, than all kinds of. Than I think maybe even the housing um, situation. So education costs have risen since in about the last 30 years by 900 percent. 900%. Uh, some people don't even graduate and they still owe tens of thousands of dollars. And they end up graduating with a degree that's completely useless. So it's, it's understandable why young people are getting frustrated. And if you look at the statistics for youth unemployment uh, in this country, they're actually very similar to the situation that existed in countries like Egypt and Tunisia before the Arab Spring. Now, for 30 years, people thought, well, nothing will ever change in the Middle East. You know, Mubarak, he's, he's there forever. He'll, he'll never be overthrown. And we saw how very quickly, once things start taking off, that, that situation can change. We had our own examples of this here in the United States. We had the Occupy movement. I know there was an Occupy St. Louis, there was an yeah. Occupy uh, Minneapolis, in New York City, of course, uh, where it all started down by Wall Street and Zuccotti Park, where you know hundreds of thousands of people all around the country just said, we're fed up. We've had enough. We, we, we're going to occupy. We're going to, you know, we, we want to protest. We want to express our frustrations. They don't have any sort of real outlet for expressing their discontent with society. In the labor movement, we've seen a, a big decline in the union membership in the last 30 years, and yet in the last year or so, you start to see the beginning of a revival in the in the labor movement. I mean, you've got the events in Wisconsin, which is a whole other talk that we could have. Uh, you had a big Verizon strike on the East Coast, and you had a very important strike in Longview, Washington, with the dock uh, dock workers on the West Coast. Um, and if, you know, even though the the working class, uh, much fewer of us are in unions at this time, the fact is that the working class has tremendous power in our hands. Just for example, 97% uh, of world commerce is now uh, seaborne. It goes on ships. Uh, and 40,000 union workers in this country, just 40,000, a tiny you know, fraction of a percentage of the, of the population in this country, they control 
every container that is unloaded, un unloaded, you know, loaded and unloaded on and off of those ships at all the major ports in this country. That's a tremendous amount of potential power. They could shut down Walmart, they could shut down Target, they could shut down all these big corporations for all that merchandise that's coming from Asia, that's going to Europe, that's coming uh, back, and so on. So we should not, you know, a lot of people get a very pessimistic, uh, you know,